Hello there. Good morning. Welcome to another edition of Knox to Nuggets. My name is Uluwa Yomiute, and it's such a joy to come your way this beautiful Monday morning. Wow. So last week, Friday, was our 27th wedding anniversary. Oh, you know, I said to myself, 27. Wow. It's in 27 amazing years. And, you know, we're all just also thankful to God for keeping us these 27 years and truly, truly in love. I mean, it's been amazing. So it was 27th wedding anniversary yes, last Friday. So shout out to my darling guest husband, Gilbert. Thank you for who you are, all you do, and for being there for me all these years. So... Today is another beautiful day. And today we are talking about raising the best among the best. So yes, it was a beautiful time out last Monday with Shegun Lawal. And we, ha we had so much talking about. And we said today, we're going to take off talking about how do you introduce discipline? How do you ensure that you raise those children and as I sat down to catch today's topic, he occurred to me, like I was telling him a few moments ago, that we must be able to develop systems that make our children the best, not among the rest, but the best, even among the best. And that is our conversation today. Good morning, Uncle Maxwell. Thank you so much for that congratulatory message. You're a part of our story and we truly celebrate you. And thank you to everyone that will watch after now. Like I always say, like the video, share it. Let me have your feedback. Let's keep it going. You are the success story of Knox to Nuggets. So today, without much ado, receive with me back onto the Knox to Nuggets platform, Shegun Lawal. Uh... Hey, hey. Congratulations, man. And to Thank my brother, you. God bless you both. Wow, 27 years. Well 27 done. 27 years. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Shegun. Last week, you left us with so much of thought. Mm. And I said, today, we're just going to dive straight in. Yeah. We want to raise the best among the best, not the best among the rest. Mm. Our children just must be those fantastic children that the world would envy. They'll not be the ones to copy the world. They'll be the ones the world is copying. Now, I'm talking about discovering their talents, de developing their talents, and the place of discipline. Shek, over to you. How do we even navigate through all of this? Uh, well, it's it's a massive topic. It is. Um, we will do our best to, to navigate it, perhaps simplify. I rolled up my sleeves this morning, as you can see. I brought my notebook because, wow, we are all good. You see, you know, we are, we are students. We've always been students. We like to learn. You know, yes, I've, I've always, I prefer sitting under teachings any day. I mean, I just think it's fantastic. And that's part of what we're going to talk about, the best among the best. If you think about the Ivy League schools in the UK, in the US, um, there is something typical among them, whichever they are. They are uncompromising in their standard. Mm. And that word compromise is critical because we must know where we are compromising. You cannot be the best and compromise. And there are certain key things you have to accept if we want to be the best among the best, if we want our children to be the best among the best. And I'm just going to try and run through them. You can stop me at any time. We can talk about it a bit. Um, but let's talk about discipline. I mentioned it last week. It is critical. I do not know anyone who is successful who has not learned to be disciplined. And the word discipline, as we know, comes from the word disciple, which simply means to follow. Mm. It is to follow a laid down series of instructions, um, procedures. And the critical thing about it, and I noted this, I said it is about conditioning. Conditioning that skips personal bias mm. or preference, but is ultimately presenting you with the needful goal. So what it does is discipline says, I know you've got personal bias. I know you've got personal preference, but discipline is aimed at conditioning you to skip that. Hmm. Because left to you, you will drop out when it's too difficult. 
left to you, I've got personal matters that need to be attended to, as we saw in the Gospels. And I'll be referring to the, the scriptures quite a bit. And we forget that Eve was really a child. We know she was a fully formed woman, but she was a child in her development. And when you study the temptation, the famous temptation, what you find is that what got her was the desire and the curiosity to know what this thing was. Hmm. And there's two things we need to do. We need to learn to establish discipline, but we must recognize that our children have desires and our children are curious. And we'll get to that a little later. So discipline. And I feel is the lack of discipline that has growth, the outpouring and the lack of control of desire. Because if you look at the Marines, you look at the Navy SEALs, you look at anybody who has learned a degree of conditioning, they've had to go through a, a period of training that skipped their personal desires. Mm. It's almost like shock therapy. You wake up early in the morning, you do your, your, your exercises, you go out and do your drills. They've created an environment that says, you are not going to be enjoying your personal preferences here. We are going to condition you and get you to a place we want you to be. Now, the problem is in these days, we, we celebrate personal desires as if we are afraid to lose our children if we don't pamper to it. Mm. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and disappointed that they couldn't pray. And what was the issue? He said, look, we want to, but we're just too weak to. They had got to a point where they were not able to follow through with the discipline because of what was happening to them personally. It is so important to create environments that skip preference, skip personal preference. It does not, it does not, um, does not, not recognize it, but he mm. says, while you are here, we're going to skip it. <laughs> mm. And in Spirit of David, for instance, there will be certain procedures. Oh, you come in, this is what you're going to have to learn. This is what we're going to do. And because you're so excited about the place and you know you're going to get to dance, maybe even on stage, unconsciously, you are ready to go through the discipline because of what you're going to gain. And therefore, you're ready to surrender certain personal preferences for that. So true discipline keeps the goal before you, but says you need to surrender personal preference. Wow. I need that to sink in a bit. Yeah. True discipline keeps the goal before you. So you're but, always focused on the goal, yes. but then tells you you need to surrender your personal preferences. Absolutely. Hmm. See, let me, let me, let me yeah. just me. He, he hit me. He said, We forget that Eve was a child. Jesus. Yes. <laughs> that never has hit me before. Yeah. Hmm. Wow. She, she was a child. And the the enemy knew how to play on, on certain things. I mentioned two things, desire and curiosity, that every child yes. has. They don't want to do bad. It's just the enemy has learned how to use what comes naturally to them, which is desire and, and curiosity, to use it against them. We, especially those of us who are who relate with young people who have ministries, and even if it's not young people, even if it's older people, we tend to not understand what comes naturally to us. We condemn what is natural. We mm. condemn things that like desire and curiosity. We say it's evil. We condemn it. So what the enemy did, he knew that Eve was a young person still developing and said she has desires and she has curiosity and I'm going to use it against her. So when we talk, that's why I particularly mentioned personal preference, because there's nothing wrong with having a preference. There's nothing wrong with having a desire. But we discover that it is important to place the goal ahead of them, not necessarily the means to it. The issues you have today in the world are not a function of LGBTQ uh, identify as this. No, the issue is identity, wanting to know who you are. And that is going to be expressed in so many different ways. Those various expressions, those various arms, they are not the problem. The challenge is, are we addressing identity? Mm. Are we talking about those things? And then are we putting them in an environment that says, I'm going to show you who you are, but you're going to have to skip those personal biases for now. Because there is no way any of us will get to where we are getting to. You don't do a diet and say, well, I'll break it when I feel like 
or I'll, I'll consume my guilty pleasure when it comes. A diet is meant to force some discipline. It's supposed to form some structure, force some system by skipping your personal preference. It's the same when we fast. It's the same when we pray. There is, it is impossible to keep um, celebrating personal preference in our children and expect them to be disciplined. It's just not possible. Wow. Hmm. 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 So if they say, this is what I want, you say, great. I want what you want, but this is how you're going to get there. You don't know enough of how you're going to get there. You're too young. You're too inexperienced. You're too um, ill-prepared. So I'm going to tell you that I know what you want, but I need to let you know that you don't know how to get there. The Ivy League school says, we know what you want. You want to be in the top echelon of academics globally. But it then tells you, we will tell you how to get there. The top Ivy, well, should I say the most generous Ivy League school still has a 14% acceptance rate. And they are the most generous. So of every 100 applicants, they take only 14. And they are the most generous. So it's as if they're saying, you either go our way, our way or the highway. And, and that's missing. You know, you need to have enough quality to sell that your way is better than theirs. Mm. But the problem is when we look at, say, the church or other institutions that are supposed to inspire example, you don't really see anything you want to be or you want to be like. <laughs> wow. I mean, <laughs> I'll give you an example. Yesterday we were, we, our church went out for a picnic. So we're all in the park all having this great time. Just one nice park down the road. And people were talking, playing, doing different things. And at the end, I just started playing um, one of our Niger songs, our Niger gospel artists. And then before I knew it, I had some young people surrounding me. I said, oh, we want to dance. Can you do it? And a friend of mine that was there said, how is it that you just attract young people? And I said, well, the truth of the matter is this. You've got to understand what they want, but present how they should get it. Mm. <laughs> and that's the gap that's the that's the skills gap we're experiencing that is the ministry gap we are experiencing we condemn what they want but what they want is natural you wanted it in your time and you still want it now it's just that we've not been able to articulate what that want is they are simply curious they're simply desirous but because of the lack of discipline they now go AWOL it's just everywhere. So I think that is, is really important to ask ourselves, are we conditioning our kids? Are we putting them in a space or a mental place where you are doing something that is beyond your personal preference? Like when we used to have chores growing up, oh, you mm -hmm. are going to want to do the louvers. You are going to sweep outside in the compound. God help you if you don't do it. But what it was doing, what it was doing is that it was raising a mindset that there are certain things that need to be done, whether I like it or not. That's a mental strength right there. Mm, mm, mm. So There's what's a question the, right there. How do you okay. make the opinionated child agree with your way? Well, like I said before, the opinionated child thinks they're opinion, opinionated, but what they actually are is curious. Mm. So it comes across as opinionated, but what it is is curious. And when they keep asking you questions and they don't get answers from you, then it turns to an opinion. So we should be able to engage sufficiently to answer the questions. Yeah, I, I know this is what you're asking, but this is the answer. This is what you're asking, and this is the answer. And then the second thing, my goodness, the most powerful thing is that every child, and I do believe adults, you mentioned it earlier, peer pressure. What is peer pressure? Peer pressure is simply, I want to follow someone. I want to be like someone. Yeah. So the question is, when I look at you, my sister, when I look at my brother Gilbert, the question is, when I see you, do I see something I want to be like? Mm. Do I see something I want to follow? How did you get here? How do you speak so freely? Why are you so down to earth? I love how refreshing this program is because it is genuine, it is sincere. When you were introducing the program, I wrote down something, the honesty of confession. That's the you're just so honest to, to say certain things. Oh, we've not got there yet. I'm not all that yet. And people look at us and say, no, surely you can't be talking about yourself. But young people like the idea that you're vulnerable and you're mm. learning and you're able to confess and you don't know it all. 
but we can search it out together. Two, seven, one, the other day. I don't have the answer to that question, but let's look at it. Let's look for it together. Let's look at it. Suddenly, like okay, because suddenly sounded like fun. We're going on an adventure together. You didn't say don't ask such questions. You didn't say I, I, I don't know what you're talking about, because they are not bad until there is no discipline, and it's your job to discipline, not theirs. Mm, they are not bad until there is no discipline and it's our job to discipline but many times because of the fear of losing these children we also run away from disciplining and i think it's because we think we are confused with rebuke correction punishment and discipline you have we kind of we, <laughs> see, see the way your face changed that's it <laughs> okay, ask again. you have rebuke. come Rebuke, correction, punishment, discipline. We kind of push, put all those things into the same cooking pot. That is like cooking eba, okra, afang, and ewedu in the same pot at the same time. <laughs> you know, it, you could argue that it goes to the same stomach. You could argue, well, I like all four soups, but there is a protocol. You just don't cook them together because they require different cooking methods. The same with that if every time you are in quote disciplining you are punishing you are sending a wrong message that is not to say there is not the need to teach about consequence but if every time the only thing you're teaching me is that i'm constantly wrong i'm going to grow up with a very failed mindset about myself mm. i agree with you sir we need to tell you that discipline is not punishment Discipline is not even correction. Discipline is, this is the way we are going. This is the way that, this is the path that has been set. Marines have followed the same training for God knows how long. That is the discipline. Oh, Ivy League schools are insisting that they will take the best of the best. That is the path. Jesus said, well, I understand your situation, but let the dead bury their dead because there is a set path here. So discipline is uncompromising in his desire to set the standard. Hmm. And a coach, an, an Olympic coach, tells you this is the world record. You could have a fantastic personal best, but do you want a personal best or do you want to break the world record? Because hmm. that is why I'm going to put you through this series of exercises, is why I'm going to drill you in this way so that you can be the person you want to be. It is a predetermined path. Wow. Wow. So how do you build this system? Well, it, it, it really depends. It, it, first of all, <laughs> first of all, let, let me go back to my notes again. Yes, go back. Address that. Here I wrote down, we fail to strike a balance between desire and what is bad. Mm. They, I've mentioned before, desire is natural to everyone. But the aim of the of discipline is to condition through systematic routine so that it is important to you to make the right choice. So what does it mean, systematic routine? Okay, when a child is growing up, the question is, you could probably say that on Fridays, what did they used to eat in your house? On Saturday mornings, what did mommy cook in our house growing up? Saturday mornings was for mommy. Perfect. <laughs> it was more my apart. To yes, the so. point that some of our friends knew and they will come to greet you on Saturday morning, knowing that she's going, <laughs> going to make more money. I yeah. know in my house, it's according to your gongularity. All your everybody's bowl is according to their sizes. So when you enter the house, I can tell who is the youngest one's bowl, which one is everybody's bowl. <laughs> and you see that thing that you're saying, that's the system you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It is saying that this is a system. To make it easier, by Friday, you're going to go and get the moin moin wraps, the moin moin leaves. You're going to go to the grinder. You're going to grind the beans because on Saturday, we're going to have this and everybody. Enjoy. And when you see your friends coming over because it's moin moin day, you enjoy it. Unconsciously, you're buying into a system. Mm. You have a meal plan. Unconsciously, you're buying into a system. It's very frustrating for wives, especially, or anybody who handles the food in the house, even if it's a shared responsibility. It's very frustrating sometimes when you don't have a timetable. You're constantly thinking, what are we going to eat tonight? What do we do today? So unconsciously, a lack of systems leads to a frustration. But that's not to say we can't be flexible. It's just saying 
I am conditioned enough to go beyond what is personal preference to me. You wake up in the morning, you don't feel like going to school, but you're conditioned enough to still go to school and do the learning. Because the truth is in life, not all, not all things will work for your, uh, for your pleasure or for your desire. Things will happen that are beyond your control. And that's why they cringe and fold up so quickly because they're not used to pushing beyond personal preference. They're not used to getting the job done whether they feel like it or not. Because you know what? You told them that whenever they get up, it's fine. And you told them that whether or not they do the dishes, is okay. We have a dishwasher. And you told them, oh, it's okay. You can wear what you like. Our school doesn't have uniform. So unconsciously, what you said was that when things happen beyond your control, you don't have any discipline to push through. So it's not punishment. This is not making them feel bad for what they did wrong. No. This is telling them that you're going to have to push you to my my papa you see now we're saying those good old days <laughs> those good old days in fact my wife she hears it all the time i knew the day of the week that they did fried fish in their house before i married her and i love fried fish so it's it's, it's interesting that we later in life and the child doesn't have the the advantage of this perspective mm. but later in life you appreciate the systems that were put in place mm. You appreciate them for their mental, the mental strength they gave you. You appreciate them for the set in terms of order and discipline. You've never had to call me to say, Shegun, where are you for this call? Because you know Shegun is disciplined. He'll be here 10 to, 10 to the time, 5 to the time. You never had to say, I'm going to follow up with him. I, I wouldn't expect it. And that comes from being in a place where over time, you know what it means to be punctual. You know mm. what it means to respect people's time. You know what it means to regard their time. But when we don't put even a small system like a timetable, a timetable is a system. Traffic lights is a system. Uh, your food plan is a system. Anything that says that I know you have a personal preference. Okay, when we're putting, like my daughter doesn't like swallow. Okay, fine. When we're putting together the food timetable, what's your preference? I can infuse your preference, but it'd be within a system. Meaning you can't have your preference every day. Mm. You can't have it when you want it any time of the day. But I have factored that you have desires and I have factored that you have a preference, but it must be submitted to a system. Mm. Wow. You know, you simplified this matter of systems because a lot of times you think, oh, how do you put up a system? So step one, step two. Well, you brought it to life. It's what you do or permit to be done on mm. a regular basis. That's right. That's and that's right. what it is. What that's you do right. or permit. Because sometimes, like you said, I don't like swallow, but that doesn't mean I'll eat meat pie morning, afternoon, night. That's what the child likes. Just let him eat the meat pie is okay. No, it's not. It's not about the food. Mm -hmm. It's about eating the child. It's not always the case. Mm -hmm. Please don't have to go your way. Mm -hmm. And you know, so we, we you encourage them to get up and go, like Binta is rightly saying. Someone just said, Yeah, I leave the child, he just wants to sleep. Me, no, the child knows that there's a time to get up, there's a time for morning devotion, there's a time to get just any time to go to school. Yeah, and you see, again, so don't so that it doesn't sound like we're against personal preference. That's why when I sit with her, I say, Okay, what is that your personal preference? We'll factor it in, but it must be in the system. In the system. <laughs> wow. So we've talked so much about the system and discipline. And in all honesty, I will rest it there as a challenge to every one of us. The system starts with us. Mm. Mm. Like you said at the beginning, discipline is from discipleship. Mm -hmm. It's following. Mm. So when a child follows you, where mm. does the child find him or herself? Mm. So if you don't have it in your life, you can't give it to any other person. Yep. So for every adult in the room, ask yourself, what systems guide my life? Mm. What disciplines do I have in place? If mm. a young one is following me, will they get to their desired end? Mm. So mm. let's talk about the hair. How did you come about this hair? I didn't forget. I think I forgot. I didn't forget this hair. I knew, I knew you did not forget. So I opened a portion of my book. Uh, you know, I did a very brief ebook called The yes. Truth About Hair. Because I, I did ask the question. 
<laughs> I've been asked the question so many times. It's on my website, shagulawa.com, under one of the resource pages there. And so I said about five years ago, I said, you know what, let me try and document this question about hair. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole book. It's only a 17 page small ebook, but there is a segment I just, I kind of put on, on hold to read out, and I'll quickly read it if that's okay. Yes, please. Okay, so I'd gone for administration somewhere where I was told, you know, my friend had put on, don't show the hair on the fly out. You know, it's a, it's a church organization that is somewhat conservative. So he had kind of kept me in secret until the, the from the pulpit they announced, now we'd like to welcome Pastor Shegulawa. And I came from my car. I wasn't even in the hall. I came from my car to the pulpit. And I feel all the eyes following me. Anyway, so at the end of the session, this is what I wrote. The moment I finished my session, I knew no one in the room saw my dreadlocks in the same light. I was mm. immediately approached by a visiting pastor from another parish. This lady was your standard Christian sister and perhaps a little older than I. She called me aside saying she wanted to show me something. With a smile, she revealed what lay hidden under her wig that was under a scarf, dreadlocks. It was the strangest thing. I have been approached all over the place to talk about my hair. Some simply cannot reconcile why an ordained pastor should keep locks. Some see it as an artistic statement. Others associate unseriousness to it and so on and so forth. I felt it time to share some of the depth behind this particular conviction and perhaps open our eyes to the mystery and the truth about hair and what it stands for in all its glory. Man is extremely visual and your hair tends to generally say a lot about you. Visual learning is key in mental association. We process meaning better that way. In 20 years, well, now 25 years of stage and ministry, I've learned how to make a performance much more than the song or even the dance. The best way the message is conveyed in the context of the presentation is by leaving a strong mental image to refer to. From the angels dramatically heralding the birth of King Jesus or the dove descending at Jesus' baptism, to the tearing of the veil from top to bottom at the crucifixion, God punctuates his message and purpose with visuals. Hair is a strong visual. A person could look completely different by just changing their hairstyle or color. The brain particularly remembers unique visuals. Imagine if this book cover were a pig with wings or a flying TARDIS. It will stick simply because the visual image isn't consistent with what you see every day. Finally, we are either inspired or intimidated by the unorthodox, and it tends to leave an impression that demands explanation or reason. Mm. Mm. So I found, if anything else, this is a covenant, this is a Nazarite vow, which is scriptural. Um, we know that Samson was a Nazarite, uh, uh, John the Baptist was a Nazarite, and so on and so forth. And what he says is that I have a strong covenant with God, especially for me when it comes to ministry, to minister the gospel through dance all over the world. And so every time I see it is a visual reminder of that covenant. But over time, and I didn't know this when I was just obeying, uh, this is since 2006 or so, over time I realized that it was a conversation opener, a conversation starter sure. with people who are not necessarily Christians, um, they're not going to judge you. They just love it. I've had people walk up to me and say, I love your hair. And I say, oh, it's a vow. It's a vow? Tell me, what's a vow? And then we get talking. And it's a door opener. And so I found that by just putting down some of my understanding, and I did research about hair and, and how some cultures view hair, and even on the understanding of the place of hair scripturally, it led me to want to research it. Because, of course, I, don't, I, don't, I want to try and as much as possible to, to be above reproach. And so I, I went to the scripture, scripture, studied it in detail. And that book is a game changer. If you do get the opportunity to read it, it really helps people understand that there is something more to it. But beyond that, if I may, my sister, there are a couple of scriptures that lead to the fallacy of the visible, you know, that has to do with hair, mm -hmm. right? And has to do with how we judge things that we see. Um, number one is 2 Corinthians 4.18 where it says, we fix not our eyes on what is seen because the things that are seen are temporary. So going back to the fallacy of the visible, there is a tendency to put a lot of trust in what we see, forgetting that there is more to it. You know, And that's why even though it is seen, it is a drawer, it draws people. So I can explain the things that are not seen, the understanding of 
the service of God that I'm in, the understanding of his covenant, the understanding of what it means to be uh, separated. So there's a whole lot more. Uh, we also know that in 1 Samuel 16, 7 is one of my favorites, when they were trying to select a new king and they, yeah. they were going to go with the tall, handsome, tall, dark, yeah. and handsome dude. And Samuel says, God, this is God speaking, God does not consider the outward appearance. He doesn't mm -hmm. judge, doesn't decide by, doesn't gaze, doesn't think. And the CV puts it this way. People judge others by what they look like, but I judge people by what is in their hearts. Mm. And, and again, over time, I realized that there is a confidence in looking the part. It doesn't mean you are the part. And for those of us who may not look the part, there is an extra effort to make sure we are genuine through and through. So you find that... Uh, for, at least I can speak for myself. You, you, you know you have to have a deeper walk. You know you have to have a stronger walk because you know you're going to be judged by, from the outside, even though that's not supposed to be the case. But imagine mm -hmm. if nobody's judging you when they see you. Imagine how much you will get away with that nobody knows of. So there is no discipline. There is no drive to make sure that you are in that walk because nobody's questioning you. You look the part. You talk the part. You know how many people have risen in the ranks in various churches and organizations that have very evil and wicked hearts. And we know because we've been there, we've related mm -hmm. with them. But mm -hmm. because they didn't look mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. So the fallacy of the visible, that even in our generation, we just have so much trust in the way things are presented. And people, people see that that way, that's the only way I'm going to get any respect if I look a certain part. So let me do that. And there is not enough focus on the things that cannot be seen. And Jesus says, you know, when you pray, go in secret and pray. Your heavenly father that sees what you do in secret will reward you openly. So there is that desire for more than the visible yet again. You know, it just goes on and on. In Colossians 1.16, he says, I made the seen and the unseen things. There is such a need for us to know that it's not just about what we see. Last week, I mentioned the spectrum of light in physics. Yeah. The spectrum of light, let's assume, is this wide. Visible light is this small. So you still have ultraviolet, you still have microwave, you still have infrared, you still have all those other forms of light in the spectrum. And if you use a prism and you split that spectrum, you'll see visible light. So why do we put so much emphasis on what is seen? Because the enemy knows that people are making judgments based on what they see. That's why the most successful apps are video-related, visual-related apps. Because we make an entire judge. Look, you don't know me because you see me. You don't know me until you know me. You don't know me until you experience me. True. But because we can go online, and I've talked with people who have been so depressed, their marriage is about to scatter. Meanwhile, their Instagram page, they're hugging each other and loving each other. And they say, hey, and somebody will put a comment, marriage goals. Mm. But you have no idea, honey, what's going on behind the scenes. Mm. So, again, part of our raising excellent children, the best among the best, is by grooming the unseen part of life. Mm. The part that nobody's going to see or celebrate. The character over the visuals. What does this hair even mean to you? You can judge me if you like for my hair, but you don't know the gravity and the depth. People who read that book have said, wow, I had no idea. So we are very driven by what we see. We are driven by status messages, DPs, Instagram posts, TikTok messages. We are all about the visual until we start showing people the more behind the scenes. There's not going to be depth. Mm. Depth is never visual. I mean, the part of the tree that sustains it is not what you can see. Never. The Bible talks about a man who finds treasure hidden in a field. So mm. the value of the treasure was what wasn't seen. And he bought the land that could be seen at a lesser, lesser value than the treasure that couldn't. So there is always more to our children that can be seen. And we need to let them know there is more to you that I, that I, than what I can see. Hmm. Hmm. I'm ranting now because I, I, I ah. know how, how they are. They're just so concerned about how they look, concerned about true, the right True. Well, it's our duty to let them know it's beyond what you see. You are more than what people can see. There's mm -hmm. so much in you. I said something, building the invisible character. Mm. Oh, my goodness. Character. Build Somebody the invisible. Question. I think that's oh, Did good, I miss right? it? Build the invisible till it becomes visible. Mm. Shagun, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> 
You know why it's true? Build invisible until it becomes visible. Mm -hmm. I have to write down. That's what Jesus said. He said, pray in secret and I'll do what you did in secret. I'll make it open. You don't start the other way around. And because we're not building enough invisible, all we're getting is visible. And the, the scripture itself says, but that's temporary. I just read it from 2 Corinthians. He says, all things that are seen are temporary. So how is it that you expect to have a lasting character on something that is temporary? Mm. And then we, we, we become surprised when you say, ah, so this person is like this. Oh, I didn't know this person could do this. It's not surprising. And so mm. the right systems will force the invisible to come out. Mm. The right systems will force the invisible to come out. Just let me tell, let me give you, let me give you another example of a right system: fire. The, there's a story where Paul was stranded on an island. You remember, and yeah. he was gathering sticks to build a fire. I and knowing to him, one of the sticks was a snake when he had put it over the fire, and he beat him. And I learned a long time from um. I forget the name of the teacher now, way back in my school days. The fire will bring out the serpentine nature. The thing is, sometimes you need to know what is invisible. You, you, can't, you need to put people in situations to show you what is going on inside. All right, do you know you get more truth from an argument than compliments? Mm. When people are fighting and they're angry and they're upset, you will say what is truly in your heart, even if it's wrong to say it. But that's where the serpentine nature comes, is distinguished from the sticks, the serpents from the sticks. It is, mm. it is important to be ready to relate with what we cannot see, because what we cannot see is more real to God. He says, I don't judge what men see. That is not real to me. I judge the heart. If you want to raise excellent children, we have to be even more concerned about what we cannot see. Just because you see them passing exams, you see them wearing turtleneck, they're not wearing miniskirts. It will shock you that the person inside is wearing miniskirts. Plenty. Inside, very short. inside in their heart, but because they know they can't get away with it, on the outside is something else. There is a need for us to see, to respect the visible, yes, but it's a fallacy. Hmm. I'm not sure. I think we are on a, part, on a journey to part three. <laughs> we'll, we'll just we'll just keep it we might not do part three immediately but we must come back to this conversation someday sometime somehow because beyond the children is also helping us helping mm. us the adults also mm. no matter how good you are today you can be better i'm glad you said that you know i said that you're so refreshing even though we're talking about children, can we be honest? Are we seeing ourselves in some of these comments? Absolutely. Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's easy to talk about somebody when you're actually talking about yourself. <laughs> hey, you when they say, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> when they say, I'm asking for a friend. It's usually you. <laughs> but that's the way it is. The fact that you are still alive today tells me you're not yet your best person. You're not yet your best self. And you can still be better. And all of this will help us get better. Uh, Binta says, please continue. <laughs> <laughs> we need to continue the convo. Ramatu says, thank you so much for all these insights. Uh, yes. Mecca says, precious things are never always apparent. And you see, that scripture I just brushed over is my scripture. I don't think the owner of the land would have sold it if he knew the treasure that was hidden in it. He won't have. Why would he? He drink? He would now, never have. The enemy is buying up land because he sees what we don't see. Ugh. We've done 40 minutes. <laughs> Let me stop there. He's buying, he's, he's buying up land. Hmm. Interested in the people we are rejecting because he sees something we don't see. Mm. Mm. He, he was a child. The treasure in the land that you can't <laughs> see. Mm. Shegun. Ma'am. Always refreshing talking to you. Thank always you. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, everyone, that joined us. Refreshing. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this, to stay yeah. up this late to get this done. I honestly don't take it for granted. Thank you so much. And thank mm -hmm. you for being real, bringing it fresh. You know, when I read your book, I'm like, this guy won't kill me. And you came up <laughs> today and you're at it again. Well, thank you so, so much. 
we will come back some other time. I'll leave you. I'll, I'll let you drink water a bit. I mean, <laughs> and you. I'm going to come back. Because beyond the children is also us. And there's so much in us that the world is still looking for. Like I always tell people, let your graveyard be the poorest place because mm. you emptied yourself mm. before you got inside. So every day, just be a better version of you. Thank you once again, Shego. Thank you You're so welcome. much. You're I'll welcome. bring you back sometime pretty soon. You know, I'm always open to you, man. Thank you so much for your support. And I to appreciate your partner. you. Congratulations again. Thank you. My love to your family. Big hug to them. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day. Please go catch a good sleep and have a good week. I, I shall. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye for now. Wow. That was Shegun Lawa. Awesome guy. Awesome nugget. So many things to learn from. And thank you to every single person that's joining me today. Thank you so much for your share of your time. Like I always say, like the video, share it. Let someone out there know there's something called Nox to Nugget. And as we enter into the month of July, starting the second half of the year, I want to encourage you dare to do something different the second half. Let not be kiss Sarah Sarah. Let this second half of the year speak much more than the first half has. And until I come your way next week, Monday, don't ever forget if you can think it, you can be it, and you can have it. And always together we win. God bless you. Have a great, great, great week ahead. I love you all. Thank you very much and God bless you. Bye for now.